Have you ever had doubts about your faith? You know, wonder if all the stuff you believe about God and the Bible is true or not? There are lots of things that can push us in the direction of doubt. And if you do go through times when you're just struggling to have faith in God, know that you're not alone in that. Everyone, and I mean everyone, has times when they doubt. When you read the Bible, you discover the Bible is full of examples. And throughout history, names you associate with faith, like Martin Luther, C.S. Lewis, Charles Spurgeon, and many more, talked of deep times of doubt. They, like we, sometimes found it easier to believe their doubts and doubt their beliefs. Well, in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, Rasul Berry is going to lead some conversations with the Discover the Word group about doubt. So join Rasul, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day as they talk about doubting our doubts. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. Great to have you here with four of the regular members of the group as they explore together this subject of doubt. Because doubt shows up in so many areas of life, it seems. At times, things happen that eat away at our faith in the church or in doctors or in the government, in education, and basically other people as a whole in addition to doubting ourselves and, of course, doubting God. Well, over the course of the next hour or so, we're going to explore some scriptures together that can help us see that the presence of faith does not necessarily mean the absence of doubt, and that in looking at these passages, they'll help us to turn doubt on itself and give us some reasons to doubt our doubts. And so why don't you go ahead and pull your chair up to the table with Rasul and Elisa and Bill and Daniel as Rasul gets the conversation started with this question. Doubt. What comes to mind when you hear that word? Um, Something bad. Usually people talk about it as if it's something bad. What comes to my mind is that I am a perpetual fan of bad teams and I have serious <laughs> doubts whether most of those teams will ever become good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So every season, while most teams start off with optimism, my teams start off with doubt. <laughs> I, can, I can relate. I can relate. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that I feel like it can be a really bad word in communities of faith, right? Mm-hmm. In the church. Yeah. And even something that can seem like the antithesis of where we should be. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, I think many of us, if we're honest, have had doubts, right? You Mm -hmm. bet. I mean, it can be a bookend to faith. Right. It can lead you to faith. Yeah. Doubt can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, questions like, how can God use me? Or, you know, Mm -hmm. will this prayer get answered? And the thing that I have been really processing recently is how the scriptures reveal that the presence of faith does not necessarily mean the absence of all doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And in fact, we find examples of those who continued in their faith in the midst of their doubts. And I think that that could be really encouraging for us. Mm -hmm. But then the final part is that while we often think about doubting our faith, how often do we think about doubting our doubts? (laughs) I've heard the statement, many of us believe our doubts and doubt our beliefs, but we need to believe our beliefs and doubt our doubts. Especially we live in a I say skeptical, even cynical Mm -hmm. culture that nurtures doubt more than it does faith. And so during this week, we're going to look at some key heroes and heroines of the faith and look at moments of crisis, uh, even moments of doubt and how we see God drawing them out of that and how by doubting their doubts, they ended up strengthening their faith. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) first the question is have you ever experienced being asked to do something you didn't feel qualified to do? Yes. And how did it turn out? (laughs) How did it turn out? Uh, I'm still sitting at this table. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, Exactly. um, I remember a couple of years after I came on staff at Our Daily Bread, I'd been away on a teaching trip and I came back and one of the senior leaders asked to talk to me and they said that they had decided they wanted me to manage the publishing group. And I said, well, I can't imagine anyone being less qualified because I didn't know anything about publishing. And how'd that turn out? I'm still here. (laughs) (laughs) I guess it was okay. Uh, But I don't have that role anymore. So maybe it didn't turn out. (laughs) I think of the times that those situations show up 
more regularly in life. So you're talking about kind of a bigger moment of, yeah. hey, have this job or something like that. But I can think of times with kids, mm-hmm. like I am not qualified to be a parent. <laughs> and, totally. It's like, you know, how do like, I get in charge of yeah. this? Yeah. <laughs> so I think sometimes it happens in those big moments like mm-hmm. jobs. And then other times it's kind of the day to day feeling disqualified for the things that God's put in front of us to do. Yeah. It can be a big source of a question and a doubt. And so we're going to look at one of the worst job interviews (laughs) ever (laughs) in Exodus, looking at Moses and (laughs) his calling and his struggle with that call that we see. And it actually takes place over two chapters. So we're going to spend most of our time in Exodus 4. But I would like for us to rewind a little bit to Exodus 3 so that we can get a real sense of the starting place. So could someone read Exodus 3 verse 10? I can do that. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Okay, you can keep going. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I that I should go? Is it who am I or who am I? Yeah. I mean, (laughs) you know, who am I? Yeah. What's up with this? Yeah. What do we know about this context of this ask? It's coming direction. from a burning bush, <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. which is a clear way God is manifesting himself. In well, this and we know that some 40 years before, mm-hmm. Moses had kind of been driven out of Egypt because he had murdered a guy. Right. Mm-hmm. Going back yeah. to Egypt, you know, return to the scene of the crime kind of thing was not probably too appealing to Moses. Yeah, not to mention go to Pharaoh. Yeah. One of, if not at this point, the most powerful person in the whole world. I mean, that'd be like me looking at one of you and saying, hey, go talk to the president about this. Mm -hmm. You're like, wait, I can try, but I can promise you what's going to happen is they're going to say, who are you? (laughs) (laughs) Although he had history with Pharaoh. So there's some sense to it. Mm -hmm. There really is. Yeah. And so what follows is this dialogue back and forth with various points of consternation and resistance and hesitation from Moses. We're going to pick it up in Exodus 4 and just read 1 through 11 so we can each get about two or three verses. Okay, I'll start it off. Then Moses answered and said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. And the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. In verse 4, then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand into his cloak and when he took it out, his hand was leprous as white as snow. Then God said, put your hand back into your cloak. So he put his hand back into the cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they will not believe you or heed the first sign, they may believe the second sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or heed you, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? (laughs) Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. What stands out to you as you kind of read this? Well, what stands out to me is he says, in my translation, I have never been eloquent. But in Acts chapter 7, in Stephen's speech, where he recounts Israel Mm -hmm. history, he says Moses was a man mighty in words and deeds. And he's talking about his early years growing up in Pharaoh's house. So I think maybe 40 years on the backside of the desert working for his father-in-law, Moses has kind of lost contact with who he is and who he had been trained to be. That's a good insight. We had a conversation 
around the table called but, but, but. And <laughs> there was where all the excuses that Moses gave. I mean, you see them all. And it's like, you know, if this one doesn't work, I'm going to throw out this one. You know, if this one doesn't work, I'm going to throw yeah. out this one. Uh, just kind of a desperate backpedaling. Yeah. I wonder, too, if maybe Moses is thinking out loud a little bit as they go, right? So maybe it's like, oh, no, I, that's not going to work because of this. And then God gives an answer. Oh, okay. Oh, but what about this? Mm-hmm. And then, oh, yeah, but remember this. Right. Oh, well, what about this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm-hmm. So clearly Moses here is doubting the calling of God, even though it's coming directly from God in this very dramatic mm-hmm. way. What are the reasons? What is he afraid of? that is causing him to have this doubt. He's afraid that he won't be accepted by the Hebrew people. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Or that he's going to get killed by Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. He's more focused on the people's reaction than he is on God's selection. The other part, though, too, is that at some point God appeals to his covenant, mm-hmm. right? And says, this is bigger than you. Yeah, yeah. I'm the God of your fathers and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What do you think could have helped Moses by thinking about kind of zooming out and thinking about the broader context of what was at stake. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you think about Abraham's story and traveling to a land he did not know and the way God enriched and blessed his life. And then Isaac and then Jacob, the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel and how God had provided for them and cared for them. I mean, if he had thought a little bit about what God had done for them, he might be less doubting about what God might be able to do with him. Yeah. We rarely do that, do we? Yeah. We think, mm-hmm. yeah, well, that was the exception. You know, this is me, right. and I'm not up to this. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that touches me is God's response, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking about doubt and how we often think of it as this super negative thing, but how does God respond to Moses' doubts? <laughs> Pretty kindly at first, right? Yeah, it's not until the end. Yeah, verse 14 <laughs> says, Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. <laughs> yeah, right. He said, Okay, I'm going to get Aaron to help you. Right. So he provides him a partner for this task. Right. So he doesn't have to go You along. always wonder, is that like, you know, his second best? Or was that the best? Well, the thing about it is, he says, I'll have Aaron speak for you. But Aaron never speaks. It's still always yeah. Moses that speaks. So <laughs> yeah. maybe he just needed a little bit of moral support. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm noticing how, like what you said, Daniel, that it wasn't till the very end, after like the fourth mm-hmm. excuse that God is like, <laughs> okay, enough is enough. Yeah. <laughs> but the posture of, and especially when he says, he asks him, what's in your hand? And Moses says, a staff. I'm a shepherd. I, this is what I know. And he says, well, I'm going to use what you know and let you know that it's not about what you know. It's about what I can yeah. do with what you know. Yeah. That actually makes a difference. In a sense, it's very similar to when Jesus challenged Peter by the Sea of Galilee. And he said, you'll be a fisher of men. Mm-hmm. Right. You're going to catch people. He's been a fisherman, so he's going to turn him into a fisherman who catches people. Moses has been a shepherd, so he's going to turn him into someone who shepherds the people Leads of Israel. Leads people yeah. out. I love that because it means whether you're a fisherman or whether you're a shepherd or whatever it is that you're called to be and to do, God can say, what's in your hand? And use that to get you exactly where you need to be and overcome your doubts so that you can step into the calling that he has for you. Okay, what has been something God has done for you that you had previously thought was impossible? I'll start. I was the first in my family to go to college. And so there was this sense of pressure, but also uncertainty about what that was going to look like for me to be there to just do everything from fill out the right forms to actually make it. And then on top of that, uh, when a recruiter came to our school, you know, he encouraged us to apply to the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm like, wait, I'm going to go from not having any context (laughs) to an Ivy League school. It was super intimidating. Hmm. And I remember when the letter came and I praying right you know over the letter and mm. then wanted to opening up and realizing I got accepted it just was this incredible moment wow. of joy and yet at the same time some doubts about <laughs> if I could actually make it and so yeah on the back end on that four years later to have kind of graduated and and done well it was just really like wow god you really did this but mm. it was something I had not seen around me before so That's it was powerful it was a big question in my mind. Yeah. And I love that story, Russell. That's that's beautiful. We grew up really, really, in my understanding, poor in, in a world that was quite wealthy. Mm-hmm. Our little family, single mom, divorced family. And while my dad provided alimony, it wasn't very much. And I always felt like 
oh, I was always terrified of being able to survive. And, you know, I knew I didn't look like everybody else and wear the stuff everybody. So I came into adulthood, you know, really young, needing to provide for myself and put myself through school and, you know, to watch God provide semester to semester for tuition or through my job or a housing situation with reduced rent or, you know, whatever blew me away. And then even today, I'll, you know, just get out of my car and I'm like blown away that I get to have a car. You know, it's, it is such, I know a lot of people don't. And so I I just don't want to ever take it for granted. Yeah. Mine was a similar type of situation financially where I don't know that I was thinking to myself, I thought something was impossible, Mm -hmm. but the amount of fear and worry and concern that I was feeling because of a financial situation that we were in obviously was that I thought something was impossible, which was that we were going to make it. And then just watching again, the Lord provide in really cool ways, like somebody anonymously putting money in our bank account. Somehow they knew which yeah. bank we were at. I called the bank because I thought they made wrong? a mistake. <laughs> they're like, no, somebody came in and mm. put money in the bank. And mm. so just stuff like that, that I don't think in the moment I was thinking this is impossible, mm. but everything in me thought it was impossible mm-hmm. and the Lord provided. Well, I was going to tell a money thing too, but I'll go something different. I grew up in a family of seven kids, three brothers and three sisters, and all three of my brothers were tremendous athletes. And when sports came around, I was kind of a late bloomer, but I've always loved sports. You guys know that. I talk Mm -hmm. about it too much. (laughs) When I went to college, I walked onto the football team. I made the team, but then I had to quit because I didn't make it well enough to get a scholarship. And so I had to get a campus job, and that had to take place while practices were happening. So I thought, you know, sports is just never going to be something I get to do. And then a couple of years later, when the school started a soccer program, never having played soccer, I tried out for the team as a goalkeeper and ended up for two years being the starting goalkeeper and got to mm-hmm. play competitive sports at an intercollegiate level, which to me just was so far mm-hmm. off the realm of possibility. But it was something that I'd always dreamed of. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I love hearing these stories, and it's such a reminder of – The fact that oftentimes, especially when we are really yearning for something like deep within our hearts or there's some goal or or thing, but also has experienced a lot of setbacks and defeats. Or if it's something like in my case where I just hadn't seen it done before, Mm -hmm. that we can all ask that question. Is this too hard for God? Mm -hmm. Like, I know I believe, but can he do this? Yeah. And that's something I think we can all relate to, and especially to someone that we're going to read about today can really relate to that. We're going to talk about Sarah in Genesis. But before we dive into Genesis 18, what do we know about Sarah and Abraham? They're old. (laughs) I mean, they are old. And what always strikes me is that even though Sarah was like pushing 90 years old, all these world leaders saw her as so beautiful (laughs) that Abraham was afraid that they were going to kill him to get her. I think it's one of the most fascinating things. And in both situations, they talk about Sarah being his sister to kind of protect the family because they don't want to take a chance of Abraham and the rest of the people in the family getting wiped out and then Sarah being taken as Mm -hmm. a bride for one of these kings. And so out of fear, they, instead of trusting God Mm -hmm. in those situations, they kind of take it into their own hands. It's also interesting too, because really early in the story, chapter 11 of Genesis, we find out that Sarai, which is what she was called earlier on in the story, was barren and had no children. So right at the very beginning of meeting Abraham, we find out that Sarai can't have children. And then at one point right before this, they also decide to take that into their Mm -hmm. own hands. Mm -hmm. And as a result, Abraham has sex with Hagar, uh, which is a, a servant in the household, and they have Ishmael. And that's one of the worst situations, I think, in the whole Abraham story. Well, and the consequences of it go on yep. today. Isaac and Ishmael, mm-hmm. we see the consequences in the Middle East all the time. Right. And then we think about Abram's name, Exalted Father, yeah. right? Oh, so right. like from the very origins of this story, you see someone who's barren, you see someone who wants to have children. And how significant would that have been in their time for a woman to have been barren? Oh, it's huge. I mean, culturally, what gave a woman value was becoming a mother and right. providing the, the progeny. Yeah. So then we have this kind of promise from God, you know what, you're going to have a child. 
and it immediately happens, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> there are years before years. The, the baby actually arrives. It, even when it's first said, it seems preposterous to them. Right. Mm-hmm. Impossible. And, and so the years, the amount of time matters because I think when we think about that question, is something too hard for God? You might have one answer to that 25 years ago. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but then after praying for the same thing for over a decade, over two, it starts to maybe feel like a different answer. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of in that context that we join them in Genesis 18, starting in verse 10. So we see that the Lord appeared to them by the oaks of Mamre and reaffirming what's about to happen. Could someone just read? Let's start with verse 9. Okay. Then they, visitors who've come by the place where they're camping, then they said to him, Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Verse 12, so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? So what's her reaction to hearing this news? She laughs. I mean, how many of us, we might not have laughed out loud with a knee slapper, but I mean, inside we're kind of like, yeah, yeah right. You're you exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny to read the exact words after I'm worn out and my Lord is old. You know, you might think about that physically in terms of actually bearing a child, but I kind of went to, how am I going to chase a toddler, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think if she was around today and this happened, she probably would have said, yeah, that ship sailed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. But what's interesting is that when the Lord confronts her about laughing, she says, no, I didn't laugh. Yeah. He said, no, you did laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Which always makes me laugh yeah. when I read this section. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I got caught. <laughs> but this question, is anything too hard for the Lord, appears here. And there are all these reasons that for Sarah, the answer could have been, I think it is. It's I'm past my season. I've been praying for this for so long. It just hurts even too much. You've ever been in a place where it almost just hurts to keep believing. Yes. And yet we know the end of the story that God does do it. And it's not too hard, friend. But I'm moved to connect and resonate with Sarah because I think we've all been there where sometimes the holding on to the belief is even more difficult than just letting it go. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just want to zoom out because what we're not saying is that this is a formula where everything that one prays for, Mm -hmm. that that happens. Right. But what do you think is important for us to grasp that even if a specific prayer that I have doesn't get answered, that I can still be able to doubt my doubts and and believe that in the God who can do it? Yeah, I think for me, the takeaway from this is there are no guaranteed outcomes But we can be absolutely confident of God's ability, regardless of what he chooses to do or not do. I think we so focus on outcomes Mm -hmm. that if we don't get the outcome we want, we immediately doubt God. But it may have nothing to do with his ability. It may have everything to do with his purposes Mm -hmm. and what he wants for us. I'm really struck by your last point, Rasul, that it's hard to keep believing It's really hard. It hurts sometimes to keep Mm -hmm. believing because every time we want it again, we have to feel again the lack. Every time, Mm -hmm. you know, whether you're waiting for somebody that you love to come to trust Jesus or to feel better or to be kind to you or to forgive you or whatever, you know, those things are so painful. And yet if we don't enter them, what might we miss? And I think back to our other conversation about Moses, you know, what might our refusal to believe cause us to miss? The thing that also Mm -hmm. I keep going back to is the zoomed out purposes of God Mm -hmm. that helps us to align with perspective about his power and ability. God had made it clear to Abraham and to Sarah that this is part of the story that I'm telling and that the goal of this is not just you being able to have a kid as great as that is, but it is for me to Mm. be able to touch and reach the entire world with my love, with my grace, with my truth, so that your descendants would be as numerous as the stars. And here we are, the essential spiritual descendants of that truth. And so I think when we get tapped into that, we can say, not my will, but thy will be done and realize that nothing is too hard for God. Yeah, we can read in the Bible and look back at times in our own lives and see that 
Yeah, time after time, God keeps his promises. And yet, there are times when doubts still creep in, especially while we're waiting. Can God help with this situation? Is he at work, even when it seems from my perspective that he's not? Well, it's pretty typical to think that faith and doubt are mutually exclusive. If we have faith, then we won't doubt. And if we doubt, then we can't have faith. But what if faith and doubt can exist together, one motivating the other in such a way that in the end, our trust in God is strengthened? Well, that's what we're talking about in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast about doubting our doubts. And when they continue this conversation about doubt, Bill is going to talk about a time when he had some doubts about his parents. It was the year that he had lobbied hard with them to get a guitar for Christmas. And they gave me a dictionary. (laughs) (laughs) The worst Christmas present in the history of Christmas presents. A dictionary? Really? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty rough. I'm not going to cry. (laughs) And so hear more of that story and... See how it fits in our series about those times when we're having doubts about aspects of our faith in God. A helpful perspective that can help us doubt our doubts comes up after this short break. Glad you could be part of the group with Lisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry this time. And did you know that on our website, you'll find our current study, as well as an archive of hundreds of series, thousands of conversations on various topics and passages of Scripture. Many have found that archive part of the website a great tool for themselves and also for inviting friends to join the group and study the Bible with us. Check out that archive tab. That's on our discovertheword.org website. And I want you to know that we are grateful to have friends like you studying with us. And we're especially thankful for the supportive friends who make this ministry possible through their financial giving. Discover the Word is free for anyone to listen to, but of course, producing and distributing these studies comes at a rather large expense. And so your gift today, no matter the size, will help us continue to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible accessible to people all around the world. You can show your support by giving online at discovertheword.org. Look for and click on the Donate tab. And now back to this conversation about doubting our doubts as Rasul gets this part of the conversation started by drawing that Christmas story out of Bill. Think back to your childhood. What's something that you desperately wanted, but your parents refused to give you and you resented them for it at the time, but later realized that they were right and it was good? Okay, I'm going to jump in on this one. And Elisa, I think, has probably heard me tell this story before. I was 12 years old. That was 1964. The Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan, and more than anything in life, I wanted a guitar. And so all year long, I bugged my parents that for Christmas, I want a guitar. And they gave me a dictionary. (laughs) The worst Christmas present in the history of Christmas presents. Of course, now I deal with words all the time. Mm. So the dictionary actually turned out to be a pretty good gift. But at that time, nothing could have been more heartbreaking to me than a dictionary when I wanted a guitar. Mm. Mm. (laughs) Mine actually, a Christmas present comes to mind as well, but it was with my grandma. And she gave me a particular Bible that I remember at the time, like, oh, I've got so many Bibles. <laughs> and 15 years later, I picked that up, and that particular translation was just life-changing for Aww. me in such a good way. Grandmas are good for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I remember there was some neighbors down from my aunt's house, and they had kids our age that we would play with. And when we had to come in, you know, street lights went on. They could stay out. Mm. They didn't even have to go to school. They just seemed to have no rules. Mm-hmm. And my mom was mm. super strict. And I was like, you don't love us because yeah. you love this. You would let me do just <laughs> be free. And later on, as I started to realize the detrimental effects to that neighbor and those kids not having structure and realizing that my family had set me up well to be able to thrive after that I was like man I'm glad that you didn't give me what I wanted Mm -hmm. but at the time Mm -hmm. I was really jealous Mm -hmm. only thing that comes to my mind is I want 15 helpings of ice cream you know (laughs) (laughs) hey that works I don't know about you all but I love telling these stories 
to my kid. You yeah. know, I know because you can see it replay itself. It's One like, day you'll thank me for this. Exactly. <laughs> you know what? When my son Andy asked us for a guitar, we got him a guitar. See, <laughs> there, there is that sign. And he's now a worship pastor in a church. Yeah. The reality, though, is that when we think about those disappointments, those Christmas Day mm-hmm. gifts that didn't get received mm-hmm. or that freedom that didn't get experienced, that kind of disappointment can lead to the doubt about the motives or even the goodness of our parents or those who are watching over us. Yeah, or even their thoughtfulness. Like, did they even think about yeah. what I would actually want? Right. Yeah, a dictionary, really? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty rough. I'm not going to cry. Like, I had that. But you're a writer, yeah. so, I mean, yeah. God knew. Yeah, I wasn't a writer when I was 12. I was yeah. destined to be the fifth Beatle when I was 12. <laughs> you're destined. I love that. So, you know, last time we talked and we looked at the question of, is anything too hard for God and recognizing that the answer to that is no, but there's this other side where we can even question God's goodness goodness if Mm -hmm. we don't see the things happening that we desire or hope like why what's going on there Mm -hmm. and particularly there's a woman that I think of that can give us a lot of perspective and insight named Naomi in the book of Ruth so I want to go there and see how she wrestled with this Mm -hmm. aspect of God's goodness so we're going to just read the uh, 14 verses from Ruth chapter 1 who would like to kick us off I'll start us In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilion also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Hmm. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. And said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Whew, a lot of yeah. emotion packed in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's gripping. And I mean, the way that this is written, we see the context in the stage. Let's kind of just set up what is the kind of global meta narrative that's happening that we find these women in? Well, it's a season of famine, right? which is ironic because the name Bethlehem means house of bread, mm-hmm. but there was no bread in the house of bread. And so they actually go to Moab, which was another Semitic tribe, another one of the tribes that were kind of like cousins to the Jews, but also from time to time were enemies of the Jews. And so there's a, there's some interesting things kind of sprinkled in there. This whole narrative of patriarchy, too, is so strong in this passage. Here are the three women who were destitute because there's no connection to men. And yet they're in possibility too. Naomi's too old to have more sons. Orpah and Ruth are left without. Yeah. And even going back to their mother's house would have been kind of a desperate, Mm -hmm. we hope our mothers will take us back in because they may not. Because there's no guarantees. Yep. Yeah. And Naomi's response to these struggles is interesting. What do you see going on in her inner world as she thinks about these circumstances? Hmm. Well, she says that the hand of the Lord has gone against me. So all of the circumstances in her life, she sees as God directly inflicting upon her. And you can almost imagine her wondering, 
what did I do to deserve this, right? right? Mm-hmm. And I see some practical mm-hmm. advice here, yeah. right? Like, mm-hmm. look, you have a better chance going back and hoping your parents will take you back in than you do with me. Right. So you should do that. Not only that, but you'll at least be with your own people. Yeah. And I can't do anything to provide for you at this point. So there's like a releasing and a compassion there from her a little bit, That's I think, good. too. How can we relate to Naomi? Well, I've got a few friends who are widows, and it is tough. Yeah, and maybe people that have lost children mm-hmm. as well, yeah. right? There's also the sense not only that she lost a child, but all that that implies in that culture as far as future security, future help, future mm-hmm. hope, all that kind of stuff. Like you said, Elisa, the patriarchal culture where men dominated and without a man in your life, you were in big trouble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so in the midst of that, we can understand why Naomi is questioning God's goodness, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Like sometimes we can have that mm-hmm. perspective, you know, that man, maybe it's something I did. Yeah. But in the midst of that, by chapter four, we see a completely different person, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That this moment of Ruth clinging to her, which at the time may have been even frustrating mm-hmm. um, for Burdensome. Naomi. Right. That she's like, I'm not going anywhere. Your God is going to be my God your people will be my people, that that is the provision that God gives Naomi to see the sense of a renewal take place, a restoration take Mm -hmm. place. And by the end, we see her, you Mm -hmm. know, as a grandmother with this bouncing baby boy Mm -hmm. on her knee and being honored by the people Mm -hmm. who before Mm -hmm. kind of looked at her and go, man, she's going through a really tough time. So there was a goodness there, but it took time to play itself out. And the end of the story is very much a fulfillment of all the things she says are impossible in chapter one. Right. Like, I can't provide a husband for you. (laughs) By the end of the story, Ruth has a husband, you know, and then the idea that there's a grandchild as well. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that they're coming out of a famine Mm -hmm. and now they have food. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many pieces of that story that are really beautiful. Well, and that she becomes the great grandmother Mm -hmm. of David. Exactly whose line would produce Jesus. I mean, you just have to know that the narrator, whoever it was that authored this book, was just waiting to pop that punchline at the Mm -hmm. end. So cool. Yeah. And I think there's a really practical application for us. One, we don't know the end of the story. We might be in a tough part of the story. It may be particularly bitter right now. Yeah. But hold on to the hope that God can still... Yeah. make lemonade out of lemons. Yeah. But then the other part that I think I'm struck by is having a Ruth around to help see that hope. And I'm wondering if there's some Ruths that we might need to reach out to mm. and let them know that we're going through a, experiencing a bitter time. Because sometimes we need that help in order to see the hope and to see the goodness of God. And maybe sometimes we can be a Ruth Mm -hmm. to somebody else who we see is going through Mm -hmm. a hard time. We can encourage and support and help too. Yeah. And then not being too prescriptive on the way that we think God should answer whatever the pain is that we're experiencing. Because Ruth and Naomi at the beginning of this story could not in their wildest dreams have imagined how God was going to take care of the two of them. And oftentimes we have very prescriptive ways that we think God should answer pain or suffering or whatever. Sometimes God does that in ways that are different and typically are better for the world, for us, and for others. Amen. Yeah, the story of Ruth and Naomi is a great reminder that God is at work even when it seems like he isn't. We may have serious doubts because of the part of the story that we can see right now, but we can be assured that there is always more to the story than we may ever know because God is at work and there's no doubt about that. Well, in this next part of the conversation, they're going to take us to a story that reveals how suffering can be a trigger for doubt. It can make us doubt God's power and whether or not he really cares about what's happening to us. And so, can God help me in this situation? And even if he can, will he? Those are the doubt-inducing questions that they'll address next in this conversation on Doubting Our Doubts. Have you ever wanted to help someone close to you but couldn't? Yes. Yes. How'd that make you feel? Helpless. Yeah. And at least in my case, it was a situation where 
no matter how much I wanted to help, I knew that there was literally nothing I could do to help. And that makes you feel even worse because it makes you feel like you're part of the problem. Yeah. I'm one of those people that in an unhealthy way, often, I don't ever really believe I couldn't help somebody in some way. Yeah, I know for me, recently, a friend of mine who actually was instrumental in even developing my own faith denounced his. Mm. Mm. And it was Mm. really difficult, especially because I could tell by the time we talked, he had already made up his mind. And and so I'm like kind of catching up, not knowing this has been going on in his mind, some of these threads for years. It's been a struggle to see that happen. And what I find is that especially when there's this question of suffering, Mm -hmm. when there are these questions of just in a world and where there's so much that we can look on the news or read about Mm -hmm. or hear about in our own families, it can feel even debilitating to see all that happening. You know, you just want to grab somebody sometimes Mm -hmm. by the lapel and say, no, I can help you. But there was not that sense of allowing it to happen. Right. Right. And there's probably no greater source of doubt in our world than the reality and the experience of suffering Mm -hmm. right how many times have we heard well if there is a god then why would he allow this to happen and so we're going to look at a story that we see in the gospels where we see how the desperation leads to doubt but then we also see how jesus responds to it so before that let's talk a little bit because we're going to look in the gospel of mark what do we know about this particular gospel and what makes it unique There are a lot of things we kind of draw out of the text and make conclusions from that you can't prove in the text itself. But we think that it was probably written to a Roman audience, Mm -hmm. partly because of the way Romans are presented in the story, but also partly because unlike Matthew, which we think was written to a Jewish audience where Jewish customs are told and not described, in Mark, he describes this is why they do all this kind of stuff. So it's clear in the very least he's not writing to Jews probably. Right. Mark is also kind of the Cliff Notes gospel, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. It's a little shorter. And instead of build up, we often see the word immediately. Mm -hmm. Immediately they did this. Mm -hmm. Immediately they did that. And there's some belief that Peter was the source Mm -hmm. for Mark's writing, uh, that Mm -hmm. it's a lot of his story. Right. But it's specifically when we go into Mark chapter 9, we see this incredible contrast of experiences and settings, Mm -hmm. right? The beginning, you see the Mount of Transfiguration where Peter, James, and John are up on the mountain. They see Jesus transfigured and Mm -hmm. this glorious appearance, radiant, talking to Elijah and Moses and Peter not knowing what to say. Say, hey, let's just stay up here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) Peter's the one who, when he doesn't know what to say, he talks anyway, (laughs) uh, which is really hilarious. Right. Of course, that moment can't stay there because we can't stay in the mountaintop. So they go down into the valley. It's almost like when you come back from vacation and then it's like, Everything seems to be going wrong oh, in the world. email. Yes, right. <laughs> and it's just like you're right back into the thick of things. Right, and right. we see this story. So let's read from Mark nine fourteen through 24. I can start. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. And Jesus answered them and said, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when he saw Jesus, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion, and falling to the ground, he began rolling about and foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. What has contributed to this man's doubts? Oh, he's tried everything. Well, yeah, the failure of the disciples Mm -hmm. has caused him to doubt Jesus's capabilities. And I can only imagine for him, if this is something they've been experiencing the whole life of this child, 
he probably gave up hope at some point that anything was going to happen. But then he starts hearing about mm. this guy and his disciples. And as a result of that, healings have happened like what happens with his son. Yeah. And he gets up the courage to maybe hope again and brings his son to the disciples and then nothing happens. That's a whole nother level of pain there. That's good. Yeah, there's so many layers. We talked earlier about that frustration and that feeling of helplessness mm -hmm. when you see someone that you care about suffering and you see this father being able to see the suffering of his son on a regular basis, foaming at the mouth, you know, falling over. That is enough to just cause there to be a sense of doubt, you know, mm -hmm. for sure. And heartache. And heartache. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, the pain of that. Yeah. And so, Bill, I'm glad you mentioned about the reaction of how the disciples lack of ability to help translated for him into can Jesus help me and how often can we see people who clawing and crawling their way into a church into a community of faith and then they experience another setback in that community of faith and then start to wonder maybe it's God mm -hmm. maybe this isn't it yeah. how does Jesus respond and what do you notice about Jesus's approach to the man well the first thing is that his approach is to the man I mean he says, I brought my son, and the implication is, I want you to help my son. And Jesus turns and has a conversation with the man. And if I'm the dad, I'm saying, wait a minute, what are you talking to me for? Help my kid. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it appears to me that Jesus is as concerned for the father as he is for the son, who's primarily the one suffering, but the father's suffering with his child. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that Jesus comes, been at the Transfiguration, asks, what are you arguing about? Bring me up to date. And then his next response is, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? And it goes right to what you were saying, Russell. The people around us may not be able to help us. Mm. He says, bring the boy to me. Yeah. And how often do we go to people you know, to mm. help us, but we need to bring it to Jesus? And the interesting thing about that, Elisa, is it doesn't say who Jesus said that to. Yeah. I mean, you've got the crowd, you've got the disciples, you've got the father and the son. And the when, religious teachers. <laughs> and, and when Jesus says, oh, unbelieving generation, is he addressing all of them? Is yeah. he just addressing his disciples? Because earlier in Mark, they had been empowered to do the very thing that here they have exactly. failed at. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus notices this big word, if. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Biggest two letter word in the English language. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it makes total sense in that context because he just saw a not if <laughs> you know whatever, right? Like he, he thought that there was gonna be healing that mm -hmm. happened and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that he's saying if now. Right. How did Jesus respond to the if? Well, he repeats it. <laughs> If. If. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's got to be a little bit of <laughs> vocal emphasis on the way Jesus said if. Right. It's like he's calling him out, but I don't think he's calling him out in an unkind mm -hmm. way. I think he's kind of poking a little bit at the point of pain for this man. And I think he's not calling him out. He's calling them up. Ooh, that's, yeah, that's good. good. He's calling them to say, mm -hmm. okay, let me raise the bar. You see that there's something significant about me. You are drawn to me in some way, but I need to up the ante for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and not have you go to a place of a question of my ability, but my availability. Yeah. He says, if all things are possible for one who believes, how does the man respond? And what does it tell us about him? Oh, I just love his response. It's so honest. It's like, I do. I, I do believe. But I know there's just a part of me here that, that I don't. You know, could could yeah. you help that part? You know, could you help me believe? Could you provide what I can't muster up myself? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of books in my life on praying the prayers of the Bible. This is the one that I've probably prayed the most often. Mm -hmm. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. Even my ability to trust God is inadequate, yeah. mm -hmm. and I need his help even to trust him. And it goes back, you know, Paul writes a lot about that faith is a gift. We can't really muster it up when we try so hard. You need to believe, you know. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Well, we do, but we need to ask God to help us believe. Yeah, and I wonder too, you know, we're talking about faith and doubt, and sometimes we put those as if they're in competition with each other. But faith throughout the Bible is much more a picture of trust than like mm -hmm. this mental understanding everything that's going to happen and saying, yes, I believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. It's much more of a trust. And so when we think mm -hmm. about that, it's not as in contrast to doubt 
as we might think, because our doubts are often tied to what we believe might happen. Mm. But our faith can be tied to trust that this person, Jesus, is good. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's also what's happening here, where it's almost a little bit of a play on words as well, where it's like, okay, I trust you. Help me with my doubt. <laughs> well, that's know? a good way to put it. Or something it. like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think we tend to focus on outcomes instead of focusing on God's purposes and his heart for us because we know what we think we need more than anything yes. else. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the most important things about doubting our doubts is not just so much to say, well, maybe what I'm doubting is actually true but even saying what is the significance am i placing too much weight on my doubts because maybe actually what's a bigger story and bigger significance is the presence and the reality of god Mm -hmm. in my situation Mm -hmm. and that actually matters more than my doubts the other part Mm -hmm. is that jesus can overcome the doubts he says Mm -hmm. he doesn't respond to the man's doubts with condemnation but with compassion and so for each of us there's probably a space where we're saying like you said bill I believe, but help my unbelief. And when we bring that into the light, when we bring it like a son that we are desperate to see healed to Jesus, he heals. Yeah, we live in what has become a far more cynical culture that nurtures doubt more than it does faith. And so I think we can all relate to the father's cry for Jesus to help his unbelief. Well, one more part of the conversation to go, and in it, they'll talk about possibly the most famous doubter in Scripture. Our nickname for him adds the descriptor doubting to his name. But is that completely fair? Well, wrap up this study about doubting our doubts after we take 60 seconds to look ahead to what we'll be studying together in our next podcast. Would you say that your levels of fear and anxiety have been elevated by all that's going on in your world? And so what kinds of things are you afraid of? What kinds of things are you anxious about? Well, next time, Bill Crowder leads the group in looking at a psalm in which there's plenty of fear and anxiety. What's the difference between fear and anxiety? What I learned is that fear is about something known and anxiety is about something unknown. You're just not sure. So fear is specific and anxiety is vague. Yeah, one is tangible and the other is possible. Yeah. When we think about things like fear and anxiety, we're really getting to the nuts and bolts of our humanity. These are things that all of us experience. These are things that are common to human nature. And we want to spend our conversations this time looking at a psalm that David wrote when I think he was experiencing some fear over some actual literal threats that he was facing and some anxiety about what the outcomes of those threats might be. And so discover how Psalm 59, this song of a fearful heart, can give us perspective and help to trust God when fear and anxiety tighten their grip on our lives. Be at the table with Bill and Elisa Morgan and Marty Hahn and Daniel Ryan Day next time on the Discover the Word podcast. And now, the conclusion of our study about doubting our doubts. Okay, so I was just thinking about what's a fact that you initially doubted, but then came to believe? Hmm. Recently, the biggest one that I experienced, so I ran cross country in high school, right? And I got pretty good at it, placed in some events. So the New York City Marathon was on, and I saw these marathon runners, and I noticed the time for the marathon. And I kind of did the math, (laughs) and I was like, wait a minute. According to my calculator, you ran for 26 miles under five minutes a mile, which is faster than I've ever run one mile. I could not (laughs) believe it. And then I got to confirm, like, yes, four minutes and 40 seconds is the record average pace for a 26 mile race. (laughs) Is that not unbelievable? That's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. As someone who likes to run a lot and I've ran in races like that, it's always discouraging, like in the Chicago Marathon. (laughs) You know, I'm a few miles in when they're announcing who it was <laughs> that <laughs> just won. won the race. Now, <laughs> now there's time differences and stuff mm-hmm. like that from when they start, but still, it's just, it blows my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are facts that when you hear, they kind of knock you off your chair and go, wait, mm-hmm. are, yeah. are we sure? Let <laughs> me fact check that. Well, we're about to... <laughs> 
look at one of the biggest fact checks probably in the scripture. <laughs> um, okay. And as we wrap up this discussion on doubting our doubts, I don't know if there's a bigger doubt sometimes than God's presence with mm-hmm. us. Yeah. Is he here? Right. You know, we trust in him who we cannot see, mm. but we stand on solid ground when we look and explore that. And so we're going to look in the gospel of John, probably the disciple known the most for his doubts, mm-hmm. um, which I don't know how fair that is, but we'll get into that. Yeah. I'm glad you opened that door for us. A absolutely. Bit. Absolutely. Some Thomas gets a rough deal. Yeah, maybe he should be honest Thomas or something like that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, 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 work <laughs> yeah, we'll work on his rebranding. We'll work on his rebranding. The thing that I love about this and especially the place that this story fits in the gospel of John is that we don't have to guess about the purpose of the book of John. He tells yeah, us right, right there yeah. in the same chapter. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Mm-hmm. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Mm-hmm. So John tells us right there. This is why I'm writing you. Now we get to see what's up with Thomas. Explore John chapter 20. After Jesus appears to Mary and to the other disciples, and then finally to Thomas in verse 24. Mm -hmm. Let's start at 24 and go to 29, right before John gives us his purpose. Okay. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side... I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side. Be not unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And that's us. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's us. That's it's everybody. Us. Right. So, yeah, let's talk about that for a second. Like, you're not there. There's all these other appearances in this particular mm-hmm. seven-day window yeah. that we're talking about. You know, why might Thomas be doubting? Because he saw the crucifixion, mm. right? Like, he saw what happened to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Jesus was crucified in the most horrific form of execution, maybe in the history of the world. And he died and he was buried and he was buried long enough that he was dead, dead. And people don't rise from the dead. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Even though he had seen Jesus raise people from the dead. Yeah. You right. Know, which again, that's part of the inner struggle. I kind of wonder if when he comes back to the upper room and they say, Jesus was here, If it's kind of a fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Mm. You know, I believed all this stuff the first time. You're not going to fool me again with this because, you know, through the cycles of Jesus's ministry, they had come to have a high level of confidence in who they believed Jesus was and why he had come. And then all of a sudden, like you said, Daniel, he's crucified. It's kind of like, okay, you got me once. You're not getting me again. And then maybe also, in addition to both of those, you know, maybe it's the same thing we bump into, is it, I need to know. And, you know, that's like you fact-checking the marathon. Wait a minute, I need to know what's true. You mentioned earlier in a previous conversation how that idea of the hurt involved with continuing to believe can actually cause us to not hold on to that. And this was somebody who loved Jesus. He Mm -hmm. was with them for three years. Mm He spent all this time with them. And you know, when the crowds were chanting Hosanna as he was making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, they were thinking, this is it. Mm-hmm. Like, we're going to mm-hmm. see the kingdom mm-hmm. restored. We're going to see our guy mm-hmm. kind of reign. And instead, he gets ambushed. He gets betrayed. He gets tried in a kangaroo court, sentenced to die, publicly mocked and executed. And then it's like, what did that do to Thomas's heart and yeah. perspective to even mm-hmm. be able to believe again? And also you think about with the 12 disciples, you have different personality types. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is a really interesting feature of John's gospel is he lets other disciples speak. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you Mm -hmm. hear a lot from Peter, Mm -hmm. a little bit from James, some from John. But he lets Philip speak and Andrew 
and he lets Thomas speak. And the first time Thomas speaks, it's kind of in a skeptical way. Mm -hmm. Let's go with him that we can die with him. Right. The second time in the other room, it's also skeptical. We don't know where you're going. We don't know the way, you know, and now it's, okay, if I don't see him, I'm not going to believe. And is there just maybe a possibility too, that because you're bringing up the thing about hurt again, I mean, Jesus appears to everybody. Why didn't he wait till I was there? Or why didn't he make sure mm -hmm. I got there? Or doesn't he love me? Right. And the specificity of wanting to see the nail marks. Mm -hmm. I think about Paul did say in Corinthians that Satan appears sometimes as an angel of light. Interesting. I'm wondering yeah, if there is some sense of maybe you guys were duped. So hmm. we can kind of explore and investigate various different things. But ultimately what we do see is a week later, eight days later, we see... Jesus, it says, came and stood among them, mm. says, peace be with you, and turns directly to Thomas. Mm -hmm. And what does he say? Does he rebuke him? No, reach your hand out. Yeah. Stop doubting and believe. And even just those first words of peace be with you, first of all, he's coming through <laughs> locked, shut doors again, right? right? So the fact that he would need to say peace is probably kind of important there. Like, hey, no, no, this is a good thing right. that mm -hmm, I'm here. Mm -hmm. But then the fact that he says peace first, I think that's really what sells the fact that when Jesus is inviting him to touch his hands or see the wounds, there really is a compassion and an empathy and an invitation there from Jesus yeah. uh, for him to find true faith. Yeah. And it's neat that each time he appears, he starts with peace be with you. Yep. You know, there's a real repetition of that. It's like, you might not have been there, but I'm going to reproduce the moment right. too. And the repetitiveness that Thomas responds with of my Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, Thomas raises the bar here of his identification. This is a reference of deity. This yep. is a confession. Mm -hmm. This is a confession mm -hmm. of faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus responds, because you have seen me, you have believed blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. And I, one thing I want to say, and this is why I mentioned earlier that Thomas might get a little bit more of the short end of the stick in terms of how we see him, is that there's still an option for him to say, no, nah, this uh, is still <laughs> some type of hoax. That's a good point. You know, yeah. I mean, we see one of the most fascinating things about the accounts of the post-resurrection is when the Pharisees hear that the tomb is empty, mm -hmm. they don't go, hmm, maybe oh. I was wrong about all this. They double down. Let's yeah. figure this, clean this up. Mm -hmm. So there's another option there mm -hmm. for, for Thomas, but the, he leans into the faith. And what do you pull out from Jesus's distinction here and how that relates to us? Because there could be somebody that's saying, well, yeah, Thomas puts his hands and fingers inside Jesus's hand. And so, of course, he believes. Yeah. What that got to do with me? Yeah. Mm. Well, because he's with us. Yes. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And mm. I think the most beautiful statement in all of the passages of the Christmas stories in Matthew 1 where the angel says, you will call him Emmanuel, for that means God with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that assurance is pretty mm -hmm. rich. And there's a little bit of progress here at the end. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe, mm. have come to trust. You know, if we think we'll just read a story like this and then like everything fits into place and we're confident forever and all that and doubts aren't going to come, we're really not being honest with ourselves or even with the story of the scriptures. There's going to be lots of doubts as we've been talking about in all these conversations. Mm -hmm. We have these doubts, we bring them to God and we see how God interacts with us with those doubts. And over time, we come to believe. This is back to where you directed us, Rasul, and John 20, why John wrote in verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And there's a little note in my Bible, by continuing to believe, mm -hmm. which really builds on what you're mm -hmm. saying. You know, our lives are about a relationship. And it doesn't stay the same. You know, it started in one place in our lives, but as we continue to grow with God, it builds and builds. And our doubts are never going to completely go away on this planet. No. But you know what? Our believing will continue to grow as well. And you talked earlier about rebranding for Thomas. I mean, <laughs> Thomas is one of those characters that, if nothing else, should serve as a corrective on how we view Bible characters. Because mm -hmm. which one of us wants to have our whole life evaluated based on our worst moment? All right. But that's what we do to Thomas. His worst moment is, I'm not going to believe unless. Yeah. Thomas would go on, church tradition tells us, to yeah. India and yeah. claim the gospel there and even give his life for the gospel there. Yeah. And 
all of that stayed with him because Jesus' peace and his presence yeah. stayed with him. That's right. And that peace we have with us as well. Yeah, a great way to wrap up this episode of the podcast about doubt by talking about someone well known for his doubt. But Thomas's life after Christ was resurrected is evidence that God can use everything you have, even your struggles with doubt, to move you in the direction of faith. Thomas was definitely a person of faith, even though doubt was part of his story as well. Well, You've been listening to the Discover the Word podcast alongside Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. And we're glad you were able to join the group at the table for this study titled Doubting Our Doubts. Now, Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Join us next time for that study of Psalm 59, a song of a fearful heart. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.